In the early 90s, Dallas working girls became the target of a twisted killer. They're living out there, they're working out there, and now they're dying out there. The brutal murderer was putting on a show. He wanted his work to be seen. He was like an artist, laying out the bodies for the public to view. Collecting grotesque souvenirs. The first thing we did then is open this eye socket. Then they saw that her eyes was missing. His desire would become insatiable. They knew that he would strike again. That is the worst nightmare for a detective. But what was driving his heinous violence? There's very few times you can look at someone and truly feel an evil person. And was he born to kill? In the 1990s, Dallas, Texas was a successful, booming metropolis, looking towards a prosperous future. The city leaders of Dallas always would promote this city as the gleaming, shining symbol of the Southwest. Pure, beautiful, great skyscrapers. Everyone was successful. But at the same time, Dallas had this great, shiny image lurking in the background was crime. Dallas was a very violent city. Matter of fact, the early 90s, we had our largest rate of homicide that we ever had. In 1991, we had over 500 homicides in the city of Dallas. And one formerly middle-class district to the south of the city had become the center of Dallas's seedy underbelly. Oak Cliff had gone downhill. It was crime-ridden. You had lots of crime, you had lots of prostitution, you had lots of drugs. It was not a place that you really wanted to be unless you were down there for a purpose. Oak Cliff was this desert run downtown. It was full of a lot of degenerates. It was a part of Dallas that Dallas was probably ashamed of at that time. For beat cops Regina Smith and John Matthews, one aspect of the streets would require their undivided attention. In the middle of the day, you would see prostitutes walking in and out of the street, in and out of stores. Most of the girls that were out there as prostitutes had a drug problem. Uh, drugs were the crux of their existence. We had established rapport with these girls. You know, we cared about them. And we didn't see them just as prostitutes. We saw them as human beings. One of the troubled women working in the area was 33-year-old mother Mary Pratt. Mary was a girl that had worked the streets for quite a while. She grew up not very far from North Oak Cliff, and her family still lived just outside of the, the city of Dallas. She uh, loved her family. She had so much great love. And Mary wanted out of the life really bad. The 12th of December, 1990, appeared to be a standard night in Oak Cliff's red light district. Mary had been amongst the scores of girls plying their trade on the notorious Jefferson Boulevard. But the following morning, a gruesome discovery in a nearby residential area would mark the tragic end to a young woman's life. The body was found right here in this area, and she was partially nude, uh, she had been shot, and she laid splayed out with her arms over her head. When we got there, it was probably 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, best I can remember, and the body was just left in the street. 
as you can see, this isn't in a remote area where no one could see it. There's homes all around here, uh, people coming and going all the time. It was put here for someone to discover. The victim would be identified as prostitute Mary Pratt. Despite the displaying of her body, her murder was not initially viewed as out of the ordinary. It was not unusual for street prostitutes to be beaten up, to be shot. It just seemed to be a standard case. However, the victim's autopsy would reveal that this was anything but a run-of-the-mill murder. The medical examiner opened the eyelids to write down the color of the eyes in his autopsy report. And in this particular case, the medical examiner was shocked to find that the eyeballs were gone. The eyes had been cut out so precisely that when the eyelids were shut, there were no scars, there was no bleeding, no sign of any bleeding. It was surgically precise. The FBI would confirm to police that the killer's macabre M.O. was unprecedented. The eyeball situation, we didn't hear of murders that were sick like that. It was like a trophy or a souvenir. When someone's going through the trouble to meticulously cut out an eyeball, it tells us killing alone is not psychosexually sufficient. They have to go above and beyond that and, and do what gratifies them, even placing themselves at risk for apprehension. Fifty years earlier, the streets of South Dallas had been far removed from such brutal crimes. Oak Cliff had been a safe haven for a young couple raising their newly adopted son. Charles was born in 1933 and adopted three weeks later by Fred and Dell Albright, a couple that lived in the heart of Oak Cliff. Fred was a uh, grocer in Dallas. Dell was a stay-at-home mom, and she was very much a stay-at-home mom. She ran the house. His father, Fred, was kind of in the background, and she doted on him, but she was also extremely strict on him. She was very concerned about him getting in trouble, getting sick, not eating the right foods. She kept goats in the backyard so he would have goat milk instead of cow milk. Although Charles's mother had a caring side, he would later recall a strict set of rules. She would force him to practice the piano. She would uh, have him follow her strict rules of, of manners. If, she, if he didn't drink his milk, if he didn't finish his meals, he was severely punished. There was occasions where if he wouldn't sleep and take his nap, she would tie him down in bed. If he did something wrong, she would punish him by leaving him in a dark room. Her domination would have affected him. There might have been anger brewing, especially as she controlled him. Um, but she also was very supportive, so there would have been love, so he would have had a lot of mixed feelings about women. Although the Albright household was run as a strict regime, the mother and son spent any downtime indulging a shared passion for taxidermy. They would go get dead animals in the neighborhood, like squirrels and birds, and they would work meticulously on restoring the animals, taking out their insides, sewing them back up. And then the final part of the taxidermy was to take these beautiful little fake eyes that you could order and place them into the animal's eyes. But his mother was a very frugal woman she wouldn't pay for these rather expensive marbles for the eyes. So she would just uh, force him to use buttons from her, her sewing collection. And he would take a bus down to a local taxidermy shop, and he would run his fingers through the boxes of eyes, just staring at the eyes, but never able to buy them to put on his animals. Fifty years later, Charles Albright's neighborhood had just suffered the gruesome murder of prostitute Mary Pratt. But as detectives searched for a lead, 
the killer was already planning his next attack. In December 1990, a shocking discovery was made on the streets of Oak Cliff, Dallas. 33-year-old prostitute Mary Pratt had been brutally murdered and grotesquely mutilated by the surgical removal of her eyes. As police searched for clues, beat cops Regina Smith and John Matthews turned to the local girls working the red light district on Jefferson Boulevard. They know the streets better than anyone. They're living out there, they're working out there, and now they're dying out there. The word on the street from the girls was that they felt the murderer had to be somebody that Mary knew, someone that had probably been out there on the street for a significant amount of time. What the girls were saying, they would think of their worst customers that had treated them badly and none of it fit the profile of what we were seeing. You know, some of them were just, you know, totally way off. Police were further baffled by the dumping of Mary's body. She was known to have been working around Jefferson Boulevard, but her body had been discovered in a residential area some distance away. Mary, like most of the girls, would turn their tricks only in a very small geographic area. They wanted to stay close to their pimp and close to where they had friends. And having the body discovered a long way away from the Jefferson area was quite extraordinary. Although officers Smith and Matthews had little to go on, an encounter with local prostitute Veronica Rodriguez appeared to offer a break. I saw this gash on her throat and a gash on her head. And I said, what happened to you? And she said, you know, I almost got killed. I had to jump in a drain to get away from him. And so we were like, really? Veronica claimed she had been with Mary Pratt on the night of her murder. She said that she and Mary double dated this John and that he had attacked him and that she got away, but Mary did not. The distraught prostitute would then describe a terrifying ordeal as she fled the scene. She ran barefoot and partially clothed across an open field, and she was a very small, thin girl, and she fit inside a drainage pipe. And she heard the attacker yelling her name, trying to find her. She found her way to the house of someone she knew, and that that person saved her. Despite Veronica's dramatic version of events, her drug-induced state put doubt in the officers' minds. They just thought the story was the kind of story that Veronica told all the time. But she did definitely look like she had been beaten up. However, just two days later, Officers Smith and Matthews would cross paths with Veronica once again, whilst checking out a suspicious truck parked up in Oak Cliff's red light district. We swung open the doors and that's when we saw Veronica in the car doing business with Axton Schindler. Schindler was a local truck driver renting a house in the area. Veronica was very agitated. She was very upset, and she kept saying, well, he saved me. Leave him alone. Let him go. Don't arrest him. Don't arrest him. That's the guy I told you about that saved me. He saved me. But he really didn't kind of uh, verify the story at the time that, that she said. <laughs> but they took his identification, and Axton Schindler listed his residence as in Oak Cliff. Although police didn't know it yet, Axton Schindler had actually given the address of his landlord, a local man who had grown up in the neighborhood, 57-year-old Charles Albright. As a child in the 40s, Charles had experienced a strict regime at home. It appeared that this disciplined upbringing had paid off at school. 
He was very gifted in science. He was a gifted athlete. If you met him as a boy, you would think he's going a long way. He was smart and did well in class, but he also was the type of person who did pranks. I would get in trouble a lot. He uh, was a good thief. He would steal the, the test exams and make copies for his friends. For him, going through the proper channels, like taking your classes, graduating, that wasn't the way he wanted to run his life. He sees the world as a place where you have to always get over on him. As Albright hit his late teens, his mischievous behavior started to spiral out of control. He was arrested for breaking into a jewelry store as a boy and stealing a watch. A juvenile probation officer came to see him and did interviews with him. He had never before met a teenager who was able to divorce reality from falsehood. Albright could convince himself he hadn't committed a crime. He could lie to himself and be very convinced. Charlie's delinquent behavior would continue to escalate, and he would eventually be imprisoned for a year, aged just 17. However, on his release, he appeared to have mended his ways. So he goes to Arkansas State Teachers College. He becomes president of the French Club. He becomes editor of the yearbook. He's on the student council. He uh, tries out for the football team, even though he's never played organized football before, and becomes the starting halfback. He was very charismatic, very laid back, seemed to get along with everyone, lots of superficial charm. The colorful Albright would also gain notoriety for his outlandish pranks. Charlie had a friend in college named Andrew, who was dating the most beautiful girl on campus. She broke up with him. In a fit of despair, he tore up her pictures. Charlie slipped into his room, grabbed the photos from the wastebasket, cut out the eyes, and began pasting them on the ceiling above Andrew's bed, in the bathroom where Andrew used. So wherever Andrew went, there were these photos of the ex-girlfriend's eyes staring at him. It was a hilarious prank. Good old Charlie doing a prank with eyeballs. Forty years later, local prostitutes were still working Oak Cliff's red light district, despite the twisted murder and mutilation of call girl Mary Pratt. The girls will get picked up, some will get beat, some will get raped, and some will get murdered. That's kind of the life of a typical prostitute. But Oak Cliff was about to suffer another brutal killing that would strike an ominous chord with investigating officers. In February 1991, two months after Mary Pratt's body was found, the body of another woman was found on the same street in South Dallas. Right here in this vicinity was where the body of Susan Peterson was found. Her body was partially nude. She had been shot, and she was laying here displayed. The prostitute's murder bore marked similarities to that of working girl Mary Pratt. Both bodies were dumped in the same neighborhood. Both bodies were shot. Both bodies were displayed in the same way as if uh, the killer wanted them to be discovered quickly. When a killer just dumps a body, they are, first of all, calling the victim garbage, just dumping them in the streets for pickup. Also, this is a brazen statement against the community itself. This is one of yours. Deal with it. They were not just people to be thrown in the streets like that. The pictures I saw haunted me forever. They still do. So what they did that? It didn't give anyone the right to take their life from them, nobody the right to take their life from them. Although Susan's murder had come under a different jurisdiction, 
On hearing the news, Dallas detectives feared her autopsy would reveal the same hideous mutilation inflicted on the face of Mary Pratt. They immediately called the medical examiner and said, check the eyes. And they got a call back that said, the eyes are missing. In that moment, the alarms went on because now they knew they had a serial killer. And they knew that he would strike again. That is the worst nightmare for a detective. He loved clearly taunting the cops. He wanted his work to be seen. He was like an artist, cutting out their eyes and disappearing into the night. The mutilation of the two innocent women was evidence of a most twisted mind at work. Detectives would soon discover that the killer's lust for trophies was far from over. In February 1991, police had established a serial killer was murdering prostitutes on the streets of Oak Cliff, Dallas. Both Mary Pratt and Susan Peterson had been mutilated in the most horrific manner, their eyes surgically removed during the twisted attacks. They had to get word out to the prostitutes on the street to warn them that there was a killer out there and that the bodies were mutilated in a certain way. Everybody was scared. You know, if you say a serial killer that's cutting out prostitutes' eyes is on the loose, it caused a great concern. But despite police warnings, many girls were left with little choice. The prostitutes remained out. Many of them had drug addictions. They needed money. I felt sorry for them because they were, they were stuck in a situation that they couldn't get out of. Amidst an atmosphere of fear, one Oak Cliff resident had had to work nights as a paperboy to make ends meet. It was the latest in a long line of jobs for the colorful Charles Albright. Albright, he couldn't seem to hold the job more than three months or he would lose interest in it. At one point, he bought a lathe and made baseball bats that he sold. He told people that he was a bullfighter at one time and gone to Mexico. He got a beautician's degree and called himself Mr. Charlie. He was an artist at one point. A guy that worked with him at the beauty shop asked him to paint a portrait of his wife. And Charlie spent hours working on the portrait. Finally, the guy said, Charlie, when are you going to get done with the portrait? And Charlie said, I have just one thing left to do. And the man looked at the portrait, and it was a perfect rendition of his wife, except that the eyes were missing. But Albright's eccentric demeanor hid a life of petty crime. 22 years earlier, in 1969, he created fake qualifications to land a job as head of biology at a high school east of Dallas. From there, he coached the football team. High school girls swooned over him. High school boys wanted to be like him. They would come to him for counseling. He was gregarious. He was charismatic. Um, it was very easy to take people in and make them believe whatever he wanted. That would have made him feel superior. Having eventually been sacked from his teaching post, Charles Albright continued to commit a series of minor offenses throughout the 70s. But 1981, would mark a disturbing addition to his criminal record. He showed up at this church and then suddenly became quite active in this particular Catholic church. And then he befriended a family who had a young daughter. He liked to talk to the girl and he would take her to the playground. And at one point, the parents realized after talking to the girl that Charlie had sexually molested her. The family didn't want to put their daughter through a trial and the prosecution reached a plea bargain with him, and he was placed on probation. Charlie was able to keep this completely quiet. It never made the newspapers. So in his world in Oak Cliff, he was still good time Charlie. At this church he went to in East Dallas, he was a depraved 
sexual maniac. Ten years later, in 1991, panic had set in throughout the wider community of Oak Cliff, following the brutal slaying of two white prostitutes. By the time the second murder had occurred, it was, it was the kind of thing that the newspapers were going to pick up on. We had people calling in, trying to turn in ex-husbands and friends, and uh, it made a lot more leads for us to have to run down that we later found out that weren't good. Once it became a media sensation, one of our concerns was that the killer may change his M.O. Which is exactly what happened on March 19th, 1991, one month after Susan Peterson was found. The body of a third prostitute had been discovered in a residential street. Although the victim's profession matched that of Mary Pratt and Susan Peterson, the killer's choice of target had seemingly evolved. There was a couple differences in this case. The first two had been white females, and Shirley Williams was a black female. The killer's change of MO had resulted in tragedy for the 45-year-old, who, despite police warnings, had remained out working the streets. When you look at serial sexual murders, in 70% of the cases, they experiment at a crime scene and do something very, very different that they didn't do before. So if you have a series of five murders and four of the women are white and one is African-American, that does not surprise me. Despite any differences, the killer's brazen brutality was still evident. When the officers arrived, they found her completely nude and her face was mutilated. Her body was near a school, and she was left where all those children could see her. She had been shot several times, and it was a bloody scene. With the cause of death established, there was only one thing weighing on the detective's mind. Of course, the first thing we did then is open the eye socket. They checked, and they saw that her eyes was missing. We knew then that we had a third one. As with the other two murders, the eyeballs had been removed from the scene. But this time, the killer appeared to have acted in a frenzy. Whereas with Mary and Susan, their eyes had been surgically removed. But Shirley lay here, and there were marks around her eyes. This time, the killer didn't have as much time to precisely get those eyeballs out. And he left part of an X-Acto blade in one of the eye sockets. As police chased down their leads, Oak Cliff resident Charles Albright remained under their radar. Despite his checkered past, the charismatic 57-year-old had become a popular member of the community. Forensic scientist Dr. Irving Stone recalls the 57-year-old as a welcome addition to his seniors' softball team. Charlie Albright was kind of a happy-go-lucky fella. Looked like a fire hydrant. He was wide-shouldered, strong. He had a great sense of humor. And uh, I think the fellas on the team generally liked Charlie. If there was ever any tension or conflict on the softball field, even amongst these old guys get pretty competitive, Charlie was the first to back down. He, he didn't seem to like physical confrontation. Alongside his busy social life, Charles also seemed to be living in domestic bliss. He met a woman, a widow from Arkansas named Dixie, who he woos and says he wants to marry. She fell victim to his charms, and they eventually moved in together. Dixie thought she was living with Prince Charming, who, you know, she would come home to, and he could read poetry to her and that sort of thing. Increasingly out of work, Albright's main income was from a string of rental houses passed down from his parents. But as the financial pressure mounted, Dixie was forced to become the main breadwinner, unaware that her partner was leading a double life. 
what Dixie could not imagine was that when she was at work at a gift shop during the day, that Charlie would get in his car and drive 10 minutes away to the horror motels out by the interstate and visit prostitutes and sometimes bring them back to one of his rental houses. He was very smart, so he had the ability to live in a variety of compartments. So in each of those compartments would have its own sense of morality and sense of identity. And it would depend on what, what situation he was in or what mood he was in as to what he was going to do. The working girls who knew him recall a client who liked to take charge. He went out and bought drugs for women and said he didn't want him on the streets because he worried about him. Oh, y'all are my girls. Oh, I'll go get you some drugs. I would hate to have anything happen to you. He would pay for some of their meals, or uh, if they needed money, he would give them $100. And that would even necessarily for sex. He wanted to develop these friendships with them. So they looked at him as someone who was safe to be with. Oh, he was charming when he wanted to be. He told me I had lovely eyes. But his acquaintances in the red light district experienced a change in Charles Albright's behavior. With some of the prostitutes, he began to develop a sadistic relationship. You saw two different sides of him. You saw a charming, nice side, and you saw an angry side. He began tying them up. He would hit some of them with, uh, with rope or with an extension cord. He would yell at them. He would cuss at them. He got very rough in his uh, sexual activities. I worked in a psychiatric unit for a long time because I had been in, I'd been a nurse, and I knew something was wrong. Although Albright's secret life remained hidden, one unexpected episode would leave his softball buddies in a state of shock. Two young women drove slowly past the softball team right as the game had come to an end, and some man just said as a joke, I bet they're prostitutes. Hey, Charlie, why don't you go have a taste of that? And Charlie turned and looked at that man and said, I hate prostitutes. If I had my choice, I'd kill them all. One year later, in March 1991, the twisted murder of a third prostitute had shut down Oak Cliff's red light district. You could not find a prostitute of any race on the street. It cleared the streets, period. In an atmosphere of fear, beat cops Smith and Matthews would glean some crucial information from working girl Brenda White. Brenda told us a story about this older white male driving a station wagon who had picked her up. He was very strong, very muscular. He had salt and pepper hair. He wanted to take her down to some property he had down south. She, being a veteran prostitute, knew not to go. He became enraged, and she was so frightened that she had to mace him in order to get out of the car. On hearing Brenda's description of her assailant, the officers then reconsidered an earlier witness statement from another Oak Cliff prostitute. That brought to mind Veronica's story, because she said her attacker had salt and pepper hair as well. Veronica Rodriguez had insisted she had witnessed the brutal murder of Mary Pratt before fleeing to the rental house of middle-aged resident Axton Schindler. Axton was a small guy, a very kind of shy and passive individual, not someone that could overpower these girls. We knew Axton wasn't the killer. But when Officer Matthews checked out the address Axton had provided, he discovered it was a property near to where Shirley Williams' body had been discovered. Having eliminated Schindler from the inquiry, police turned their attention to his landlord. Further investigation revealed that he owned more than one property within the immediate area. I started to run a tax record and discovered there were actually three pieces of property, one near Shirley's dump site, two near Mary and Susan's dump site, all owned by the same person with the last name of Albright. 
as a cop, I was saying, this is that son of a bitch right here. That's who is doing this. But as police closed the net around Charles Albright, they were about to learn they were dealing with an elusive and calculating adversary. During 1991, a depraved serial killer had struck at the heart of Oak Cliff's red light district. Having connected the three murders by the bizarre removal of the victim's eyes, Dallas police finally believed they had their man. 57-year-old Charles Albright fit a witness description and owned several houses within close proximity to where the victim's bodies had been found. The arrest happened in the wee hours of the morning. The tactical team had lined up and were in position surrounding the home. They burst in, they grabbed Charlie, who says he has no idea what they're here for. Having broken the case, officers Matthews and Smith were tasked with taking the suspect in for questioning. The atmosphere in the car was just as eerie as one can imagine. It was total silence in the car. The one thing that I remember is looking back and seeing the darkness in his eyes. It wasn't even like looking into a, a real person's eyes. It was absolutely amazing and at the same time, absolutely terrifying. All of the victims had been shot and had bizarrely had their eyeballs removed. But as detectives searched Albright's house, little evidence came to light. When we started searching the house, we found a fireplace that had a secret cover over the top of it. And once we took that cover off, there were like seven or eight guns in there. None of which were used in the murders of the prostitutes. They do find some exacto blades, but they can't connect them to any of the murders. They do not find the eyeballs. Forensic scientist Dr. Irving Stone was also part of the investigative team that night. Although his search drew a blank, one item found in the living room would leave him in a state of shock. On the floor in the corner, there was a baseball cap. And I looked at that baseball cap and I said, what's this guy's name? And the fellow said, Charles Albright. And then I said, he's the right fielder on my softball team. On his return to police headquarters, Dr. Stone came face to face with his former teammate. The elevator opened and Charlie Albright was ushered out, manacled and in shackles with two detectives. And he saw me, he beamed a big smile and he opened his arms and he said, Irv, come give me a hug. I looked at Charlie and I just shook my head and I moved into the laboratory. But that was, that's the kind of guy Charlie was. In custody, Albright would remain unperturbed whilst police searched his other properties, desperate to track down the missing body parts. When we had to search that doggone barn, and it was like a scene from Silence of the Lamb with lizards and snakes and newts. He had them lined up all in that barn, and we thought the eyeballs were going to be in there. I know that we saw some pickled animals, and it, on one of them, it even resembled eyes, but it turned out to be, I think, uh, a pig's eyes. Although the evidence against Albright was still lacking, officers Smith and Matthews would locate the site of Shirley Williams' murder following a tip-off from a local prostitute. The discovery of her coat at the scene provided the turning point in the case. That directly tied Albright to Shirley Williams. They found a hair on the raincoat that they couldn't identify it at first. And the interesting thing was they found this same type of hair in the vacuum cleaner from Albright's house. And they actually had to go to the zoo and have uh, their experts look at it, and they identified it as a squirrel hair. They knew that 
he had vacuumed the truck or something in order for those hairs to get, you know, in that vacuum cleaner. So that became a, a crucial piece of evidence. At trial, Albright would deny he had even frequented the red light district. But ultimately, the jury found him guilty of the killing of Shirley Williams. Although he wasn't officially charged with their murders, the cases of Mary Pratt and Susan Peterson were detailed in court. As Charles Albright faced life in prison, the shattered community of Oak Cliff would try to comprehend why this one-time petty criminal had targeted Oak Cliff's working girls in such a brutal manner. He was adopted, we knew that. And his birth mother might have been a prostitute. And with him living with uh, the thought that his mother was a prostitute, you know, it might have just festered over the years or something like that. But for many, it was Albright's unprecedented MO to mutilate his victim's eyes that was truly unfathomable. Albright had never really accomplished a thing in his life. And uh, I think this may have been a way, you know, he, he was going to make his mark in the world. There was incidents in his early life that his mother used buttons for eyes and their stuffed animals. And I usually am very reluctant to attribute future behavior as an adult to events in childhood. But in, in this particular case, I, I really think it applies. He will talk at length about his obsession with eyes to this day. In his prison cell, he reportedly had drawings that he had made of beautiful women's eyes taped one after another across the wall. In the aftermath of his twisted brutality, one question remained. Was Charles Albright born to kill? I think the key to Charlie is to understand, despite all his charm and all his cleverness, and that he had, from the beginning, an antisocial personality. His adoptive mother, Dell, perhaps sensed it. And maybe that's why she raised him so diligently. She knew that her son was going to spiral out of control. I think Albright was born to be a con artist, to be a person who would do whatever he wanted. And so if murder was something that appealed to him, he was ready to do it. Even though he had a strange childhood, he wasn't abused in any way. He wasn't sexually abused. He wasn't physically abused, really. I think it was more genetic. For many, the memory of the brutal murders has faded away. But those who were there will always remember the innocent women who lost their lives. I miss my friends. I felt like I could have done something. How dare this person come and take their life and cut it short? There was something wrong about her from the beginning. There's just very few times in your life that you can look at someone and truly feel an evil person. And that's the scariest feeling you'll ever get.